we're going we're gonna to land in Luke chapter 15. Uh, remember, we, we finished up uh, 2 Peter uh, last week in chapter 3. Uh, next week, uh, Keith is going to kick us off in Jude. Uh, and after that study, uh, we're going to go into a uh, uh, topical um, series on the day of the Lord uh, that will last a couple weeks. And then uh, from there, uh, we're going to kind of begin our summer summer series. So uh, if you guys would uh, raise your hand if you need a Bible. Anybody need a Bible? They're free. You get to keep it. Take it home with you. Okay. All right. We're good. All right. Well. We're here. It's Mother's Day, right? One of my uh, one of my favorite um, days of the year to preach. Um, I, I I think it has a lot to do with just uh, my heart uh, for um, the place that my mother had in my relationship with the Lord, uh, the the way that she prayed for me, the way that she spoke into my life as a young man, but as my older brother uh, said to me, just like towards the beginning of the worship service, you know, it's been 25 years on this earth without our, our mom. And, and it kind of shook me a little bit like, wow, that's, that's a thing, you know? Uh, and I'm a relatively young man. I'll be 48 next week. Uh, and so to live uh, more days on this earth without my mom uh, than with my mom, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, but then I began to kind of ponder during worship and I thought, you know, how blessed, how blessed I have been. And, and my wife always gives me a hard time. She's like, you know, the older ladies in the church, they've just always loved you, Ryan. They, they just always love you. And I never have to worry about like if I die, someone will take care of you. I know it. The ladies in the church will take care of you. And, and, and I've always ever since I've been a pastor for over 20 years. I just had a, a, a neat koinonia, a neat relationship uh, with the older, more mature believer, believing women in our churches that we've been a part of. And, and I think that's a gift from God. Amen. I think that, that the Lord, knowing what I was lacking, supplemented from the body of Christ the thing that I've needed. Just these, these older, godly, wise women that have spoken into my life and, and really have become uh, these these extensions of biblical motherhood to me. And I am very thankful uh, for all of you that, 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 that just continue to love me in spite of me, right? You continue to show up, even though I stick my foot in my mouth half the time and you just probably shake your heads like, oh my Lord, this guy, right? Um, and I'm sure there's sometimes you wouldn't want to claim me as your own as a pastor nor a son, uh, but I'm grateful for you this morning. Uh, but in the, uh, in the concept of, of motherhood, I just said, Kind of Sunday school question this morning. How many moms can you think of in the Bible? Just name them out loud. Mary. Mary. Okay, well, there's the easy one. We got that one out of the way. Okay. Sarah. Okay. Huh? Naomi. Hannah. Rahab. Rachel. Ruth. Who? Eve, there's another, that's the other, second easy one, good, all right. So I, I've got Eve, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, Jochebed, we often forget about Moses' mom, Hannah, Naomi, Ruth, how about the widow of Zarephath, how about Elizabeth, and of course Mary, and then maybe some of those, those lesser known, um, and maybe from those more difficult stories, how about Hagar? How about Tamar? Mm -hmm. How about Manoah's wife? Uh, uh, ancient uh, Israelite uh, rab rabbinical tradition names her as Zelphoni. And Bathsheba, a mother, right? Lot's wife. Lot's wife. <laughs> Syro the Syrophoenician woman, right? You know, but, and, and as we think about this, how many Sunday school stories can we recall that place the mom at the center of the story, right? At the, at the, as the hero of the story. And, you know, I was looking on the pictures in there, and I didn't count them all up. You know, we have all these pictures of all the thematic pictures, right? And, you know, we get David and Moses and Jacob and Abraham and Isaac. And sure, you know, Eve's in there, but usually because she messed up, right? Sarah's in there, but 
she also kind of messed up and Rebecca's in there, but she also kind of messed up. But, you know, and you go on and on and on. But how many genuine, heroic women do we get in the scriptures? Well, truthfully, a whole heck of a lot. If you dig, one of my favorites uh, is uh, is JL, right? The woman who drives the spike through the evil king's head in the tent, right? She's like, let me go get you some milk. Lay down. <laughs> Stabs him in the head, right? <laughs> that was literally like if God was going to give us another daughter, her name was going to be JL, right? So, sometimes I wonder if I should have named Sophie JL. So uh, if my wife is watching, she'll get a kick out of that. Amen. <laughs> You know, and as we think about that, right, as we think about these women, gosh, there's this, these testimonies, these faithfulness. But, but in reality, guys, if we want to really, let's just be real, let's be honest about things. You know what's remarkable? Is the, the immensity of women that are elevated from the very beginning of the testimony of Scripture all the way through into the New Testament and the leaders that show up in the New Testament that are women, Lydia and Junia and, and uh, uh, Phoebe and, and these other women, uh, Priscilla show up. What's remarkable about that is that the time frames and the places and the cultures that these women are being written about they are not a primary reliable source on any, on, on any level. That the Women are just kind of discarded in most of those cultures. They are objects. They are subjected by these societies, seen as property in many cases. Guys, even in the New Testament, one of the, and Lee Strobel writes about this in Case for Christ. He says one of the things that makes the resurrection testimony, the resurrection account so powerful is that the very first eyewitnesses are women. Women in the time of Jesus weren't even allowed to give testimony in court. They were they were not just second class citizens. They were not citizens at all. And yet over and over and over again, we see the word of God elevate women in ways that no culture. And I, I know sometimes in our 21st century mindset, we, we, you know, after after going through the feminine studies that we that we've gone through over the last 60 or 70 years and the immense writing to those things. It's really easy to try to take that lens and apply it to Jacobin. It's really easy to take that lens and apply it to Eve or Mary or fill in the blank. But guys, understand this. In the culture and context that the Bible was written when it was written, it was revolutionary and incredibly liberating for women throughout history. The law gave women rights that they never had before in any time or any culture. And for Jesus to elevate women to places and parts of his ministry... And discipleship. To call women disciples. The fact that they were included by name in the early as the early disciples in the book of Acts. Mind-blowing. It's beautiful. You know, it's important for us to understand this, this incredible prominence that is placed on women in the Bible. And like I said, it's real easy today. In 2024 to look back and go, oh, well, they kind of blew that. Well, you're reading with this modernistic lens into history that, that wasn't even available at the time. It is so transcendently liberating if you really understand the place and time. You know, at the end of the day, where would we be without our moms? Not here. <laughs> I love what Chad Bird put online this morning. Chad Bird is a theologian for, uh, for a Lutheran organization called 1517.org. 1517 is the year that Martin Luther posted uh, the 95 Thesis to the, the door there in, in Wittenberg. Uh, he writes this. It's just a little reflection on moms. He says, for our mothers, for all mothers in whom we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Listen to that statement. For all mothers... In whom we were fearfully and wonderfully made. 
who cradled us under their hearts, who suffered sickness, swollen feet, and prenatal kicking, let us give thanks to the Lord. For Eve, the mother of us all, in whose womb all our human stories begin. The first mother to spill tears from a broken heart onto the soil of her child's grave. Let us give thanks to the Lord. For Mary, the mother of our Lord, who believed the word of God preached to her by an angel. From, whom, whom, from whose breast the creator himself was nourished whose heart was pierced to see her son die and leaped with joy to see him alive again. Let us give thanks to the Lord for our stepmothers who love and care for another woman's child as her own, for grandmothers and great-grandmothers who pass on wisdom and spoil little ones with prodigal grace. Let us give thanks to the Lord. For all mothers, young and old, in whose bodies the astonishing miracle of human life has its genesis, without whom none of us would live, from, me, from whom many of us learn what sacrificial love truly is, let us give thanks to the Lord. Happy Mother's Day, and be thankful to God for you all. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful piece, right? You know, one of the things that mothers bring to the table into this broken and sinful world is this indelible hope, this unconquerable hope. It's moms that hope against the night. It's moms who hope against the darkness. It's mom that hope against the circumstances and the situation. And this imper imperishability of hope in, in these situations, every single one of them are rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 9 says this, that we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. You see, this hope, this, this indelible, imperishable hope that mothers so often demonstrate to the world around them for their children when everybody else is against you, usually 99.9% .9 of the time, mom is still in your corner. Because some of us, Let's just be honest. We are not worthy of that love that we've received. We are the bad kid that the neighborhood is talking about. But our mom says no way. Now she may whoop us behind closed doors. But she's going to stand her ground for us in front of the world, isn't she? Right? This hope, this, this anchoring hope that is rooted in every single mother's heart is rooted in the gospel and it's this anchor for our souls that that binds us together look there's a sanctification in this hope right in first corinthians chapter 7 as paul is giving his instructions on marriage and family and the necessity to continue to have a gospel perspective in relationship and in, in situations that seem impossible as he's talking about a, a wife who believes but a husband who doesn't believe and he says wives if your husband doesn't want to take off you got to stick it out and, and, and husbands, if you believe in Jesus, but your wife doesn't and they aren't willing to take off, you got to stick it out. You have got to be the gospel in this situation. And Paul utters these very incredible and profound words. He says in verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy by. By the husband, otherwise your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Guys, this is, this is a very interesting concept. That there is a sanctifying work that happens on behalf of an unbelieving spouse or an unknowing or, 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 or a not yet responsible child. Now we wouldn't say that you're saved necessarily. Right? That just because your mama prays for you. That you don't have to make a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. You need to make a decision. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. To them that believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. So just because your mom is praying for you doesn't mean you don't need to repent and get saved. Amen? Amen. 
But there is a, a sanctifying, a, a setting apart in, in, in a child's life that happens because of a believing parent. And in this case, as Paul's speaking, a believing mother. You know, one thinks about Hannah, right? Maybe Elizabeth, maybe Rebecca in this context of setting your child apart. Remember Hannah there, right? Samuel, you know, this, 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 this child that, that Hannah is literally crying out on the altar in the steps of the, the tabernacle there. And, and Eli hears her mumbling and, and crying out. And he's like, oh, this drunk lit lady's here again praying, right? She's like, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying to God for a kid. If, if God gives me a kid, I will dedicate him to the Lord. And she does. And I love, I love the story of Hannah and Samuel. I love how she makes him little outfits, right? And she brings them up to the temple or to the tabernacle because he's serving the Lord. And I can imagine just her just weaving and, and, and making these little outfits and bringing these little priestly outfits, right? To, to Samuel there in the tabernacle with Eli. What about Elizabeth, man? She spends her whole life barren until God decides to do something incredibly miraculous. Mm -hmm. And even there, he's given the oath of a Nazarite, right? That he can't cut his hair, that he can't drink wine, that he can't eat. He's got to sp uh, stay very specific to the dietary laws of the nation of Israel, even above and beyond those of the other people. And she sets John apart to the Lord. What about Rebecca? You know, one would say, oh, she kind of she kind of blew it a little bit. She got in the middle of something, but she was just trying to see the promises of God fulfilled. Right? And, and I don't know what the deal is with Isaac, if he's not going along with things, but she orchestrates events. But ultimately, guess what happens, man? She orchestrates these events. Jacob gets sent away and he comes back. As the nation of Israel, right? You know, and it's easy to look at these stories. You know, Samuel ends up anointing David. Rebecca initiates the situation that results in the 12 tribes of Israel. Elizabeth's son will baptize the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But what about the in-between, right? Think of Samson. Think of, think of Samson's parents, man. They're given this child. And he's got to follow these rules, the same rules that John the Baptist would be given later on. That he has to take the vow of a Nazarite. And in the midst of all of this, Samson almost out the gate is breaking rules. I don't know if you've ever had a kid like that, or maybe you were that kid. But listen to this. God knows the situation. And in spite of all of Samson's rebellion, in spite of Samson's complete and utter rebellion to the word of God, God still uses him. God still answers the prayers of his parents. This longevity, this long suffering of motherhood, of parenthood is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, it's rooted in what Jesus says right before he goes to the cross. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I long to just gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. Right? They're, they're so, and how many times do we hear the Lord's heart when he says, oh, he had compassion upon them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, we're going we're gonna to take some pretty creative license this morning. We're going we're gonna to step outside of the hermeneutical normal, normalcy. You guys, what the heck is that, right? Her hermeneutics is the science of the interpretation of the Bible. We're not going to look to interpret this story today, okay? We're going to look at the story of the prodigal son, often referred to as the prodigal son. Uh, it's actually Timothy Keller that kind of puts it right in its proper perspective. It's actually the prodigal God. That it's the story of, right? This, this wasteful father who allows his son to take off with his inheritance and go run roughshod in the world and then brings him back in and gives him this giant party and ticks off his son that stuck around, right? We know that that's a story of God and the nation of Israel. We know that's a story of the, the Gentile nation running off and wasting its inheritance and the Jews sticking around and getting all 
grumpy about the Gentiles coming back in. Okay, we understand that. We're, we're not going to go down the, the theological path today. We're going to go down the parent path. We're going to go down the, the application path today. This is where we allow the heart of all the moms, the faithful moms, to shine into a story that we know well. You know, we're going we're gonna to make an argument from, from absence. We never get the other side of, of the equation. We hear the story of the prodigal son from the father's perspective, but what about the mom in the situation? You know, usually in a story like this, if there's a parent who has passed, we're given that information, but we're not. And so as we read this, moms, I want you to ask yourself this question today. Because this is meant to challenge you as a mom today. Make no bones about it. I, I've encouraged you. I've thanked you. I've read you some poetry, right? Now it's time to be challenged, right? Because that's what we come into the house of God to, to be reflected uh, according to his word. Allow his word to speak to our hearts. You know, and for any of us who are, are, are existing in a situation that seems to be outside of our control. For any of us that are sitting in a situation that you literally just cannot get your mind, your heart, your head around. Well, this story is for you as well. So maybe you're not a mom this morning. Maybe you're not even a parent. But I will guarantee you that there are situations that you're walking through right now that you feel completely over your skis in. You feel out of control. You feel like you cannot shape the narrative at all. And so as we look into this, I want you to ask yourselves these questions. What would you do in this search situation? So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, you can pull it up on your phone as well. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Luke 15, verse 11 through 32. And here's the great news, moms. You're going to get out early today. Okay? You're going to get out early today. And you might even make it to lunch before 1230. So dads, warm up the wallets. Get those things going. Make sure you transfer money into your spending account so you can pay for a good lunch today. We're going to get out of here relatively early. Famous last words. We'll see, Pastor. We'll see. Yeah. Luke chapter 11, or 15, verse 11 to 32. My Bible says the parable of the lost son. And we know Jesus is giving this, this, this instruction about the gospel, about the kingdom of God. And he's comparing it to a lost coin and a lost sheep and now a lost son. He says, he also said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went out to work for one of the citizens of that country, and who sent him to the fields of the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but none would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, Oh, how my, many of my father's tired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up. I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while the son was still a long ways off, his father saw him. And was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms and ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you or against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father turned to the servants and said, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because the son of mine who is dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he summoned one of the servants, questioned what these things meant. And he says, your brother is here. 
he told him. And your father has slaughtered the fatted calf, and because he has, has him back safe and sound. Then he began, became angry, and he didn't want to go in. And so his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I've been saving or slaving for many years for you. I have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him? Son, he said to him, you were always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because the brother of yours was dead and is now alive and again. And he is lost, and now he is found. And again, we're not going to go into the traditional interpretation of this story. But man, this is one of those stories, right? This should resonate in our hearts, right? That we should see the heart of God in this. That, that even though you took what God meant to bless you with, and you wasted it, be it your life, be it your finances, be it your family, whatever... Our Father is faithful enough and big enough to run to us, gather us in His arms, and not punish us, not shame us, but gather us up and celebrate our return. And there is those people that will struggle with this. They will look at you and they'll be like, I was faithful my whole life. And look at all the blessings in this per person's life. And God will deal with them too. Just like he's dealt with Israel in relationship to the Gentiles. But guys, let's look at this from the family dynamic. Right? We don't get anything about the mom. But, but if you're a mom. And you're in this situation. And you're the wife to this husband. The mother to these children. What would you have said to your son when he asked for this inheritance early? No. <laughs> What would you have said to your husband who gave it to him? <laughs> have you lost your damn mind, right? You know, every one of you is thinking that right now. I just said damn in church, but it's in the King James Bible. You'll be all right, okay? I mean, just think about that dynamic in and of itself, husbands and wives. Let me tell you right now, the enemy seeks to divide our homes. And he will do it through our children. And he will do it through coldness and codependency. Both are evil constructs of a satanic universe. Both coldness towards your children and codependency are both evil constructs. Don't engage in them. What would you have said to this boy who asked for his inheritance? What would you have said to this husband who gives it? Would you trust your husband? Husbands, this is so necessary for you to understand. If you are not loving your wife as Christ has loved the church, if you're not laying your life down for them, if you're not demonstrating love in reality and through sacrifice, good luck having them go along with your financial decisions. That is a paltry, small reality. Financial decisions are some of the easiest things in a marriage to make. Did I just say that out loud? Yeah. They are. It's money. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. You can make more. You'll spend more. But if you are not one over financial decisions, husbands, you're probably not living sacrificially. You're not submitting to the Lord. You're not honoring him. No wonder your wife will go along with your decisions. Now you bring your kids into that equation. Now, I, I've heard it said this. If you, want to, if you want to get people really mad with you, mess with their finances. If you really want to get them mad with you, mess with their kids. And if you really want to tick them off, go start a Christian school because you'll be messing with their kids and their money. Okay? Amen. <laughs> uh, 
So as we look at this situation, ask yourself that question. Now, moms, here's the hard one. What would you have done in the time this boy was away? Would you be making a trip out into the far land? Would you be grabbing some prostitutes by their nappy head and dragging them out of the bedroom? Right? I know some moms. Would you let this situation play out? Because at some point, this young man has got to come to the end of himself in the story, doesn't he? He has to come to his senses. If we're constantly bailing our kids out, especially as adults, how will they ever come to grips with the consequences of their decisions? What would your response be to his return? What would your response be to his return? Now, hopefully it would be like the, the dad, right? Hug him and kiss him and love him and thank you, Jesus. But how often would it just follow with, did you know what you did to my heart? <laughs> I, I could hear my mom's voice in the back of my head. You shortened my life, right? <laughs> what would you do is, at his return? What would you do in response to your husband's decision to bless him? Hmm. Because it doesn't make any sense unless you understand the gospel. You see how a believing wife sanctifies her home? How a believing spouse sanctifies the unbelieving spouse? You see what happens when you are, are operating in this anchor and hope of the gospel? What it, it, the transcendent mindset that it gives you in a situation that you have zero control over? Because the Father is a picture of God. The Father is a picture, of, a picture of God's heart towards us when we return. There's no shame. There's no relitigating every circumstances. There's no accounting of the waste. You want to know who's doing that? The brother. And what would your response be and your counsel be to your older child who has done everything right, who has remained you know, obviously this isn't a message just to moms today, is it? It's a message to all of us in, in situations we have no control over. You know, many of us are in the midst of a season, a season of waiting. We don't know how things turn out. But we're called to rest in the reality of what we know about the gospel and the goodness of God. You know, it was Pastor Chuck who told Pastor Greg Laurie, and if you know who those people are, this will be even more meaningful. But, but one pastor said to another when that pastor lost his son. And he began to go down the list of things that he, I've done this and I've done this and I trusted God and I trusted God. Where was God? Because if you've never asked that question, then you've never had a real honest relationship with the Lord. Because there are times where it feels like God is distant. There are times where it feels like God's not showing up. And there is a season of, of, of waiting. Of waning in the evening, in the dark hours of the night. But Pastor Chuck turned to Greg Laurie and he said, Look, don't question the things you know for sure about God. Based upon the things you don't understand about him right now. Don't exchange what you do know for sure as truth for things that you have that are unknown. You know, it's also been said, don't, don't question in the dark what God has already revealed to you in the light. These concepts, right? What do we know about God? We know He's faithful. We know that He can orchestrate the worst events in human history, like the death of His only begotten Son. He can orchestrate those events, not only for our good, but ultimately for his glory. And that's what roots what Paul says to the Roman church in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible because I think it just gives such a, just a powerful impact. It says this, and we know, in brackets it says, with great confidence, we know that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God and for those who are also called according to his plan and purpose. 
It's that same heart, that same understanding of God's ability to take the most broken situations and transform them for his glory. Like a son who has run roughshod and then taken off and is completely distant. You haven't heard from him, haven't seen from him. It's a situation you have zero control over. Our God is capable of taking that situation and transforming it, not just for his glory, but also for your good. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10, he says this, let us not get tired of doing good. Parents, you probably need to hear that more than anything. Don't grow weary in doing the right thing. He says, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially those who belong to the household of faith. So what do we do? What do we do in this time of waiting? What do we do in this waning time where we're being stretched? What was this mom doing to insert in my, my understanding of God into this story that we don't get any backstory? She's praying, man. I believe she's watching right alongside of her husband. Maybe it's her with a better keen eyesight that turns to the dad and says, Hey, there he is. Go get him. I don't know. But the God I know and the God I understand, that's what I would lean into. She's praying. She's watching. She's resting in the good work of God. Why is there no story there? I don't know. I'm a storyteller. I love to insert into the blanks. And I will admit, it's, it's not always a safe thing to speak where God has been silent. But I feel very, very strongly about what God spoke to my heart this week as a word of the Lord for you today. That God's calling you in this time, in this season where you feel like you have no control over the events and circumstances that are operating in your immediate life or our global lives. Watch, pray, and rest. And know, know that God works all things together for His glory, but also for our good. And what should we be doing, man? Just, just casting seeds, casting seeds, casting seeds. The word of God will not return void. Who cares if your kid says, I don't believe that garbage. You speak the word of God to them. Who cares if they say, oh, I don't even believe in God. You speak the word of God to them. Because the word of God is sharp. It is powerful. It's capable to divide right to the heart of the matter and reveal the very essence of who God is to our feeble little minds. The word of God is powerful. Do not discount it in those relationships. Speak it over your children. Pray it over your children. Speak it into your own life. Pray it into your own life. Watch, pray, and rest and see the glory of the Lord manifest himself to you. Amen?